somebody is not here. Okay, let's see how she's ready. Anybody start? I'm muted. Proceed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first Fairfield Constituent Meeting of the Civic Year 2021. We made it. Tonight, we'll be discussing the project development in the Fairfield District that uh, everyone is talking about and want to know more about, and that's called Green City. Uh, as you see, normally we would be meeting at uh, another venue. We are virtual. And we ask if you have any comments or questions, you write them in the chat section on YouTube.com. We will review them after the presentation. Uh, tonight, we have a guest presenter, Mr. Michael Hallmark from Green City, LLC. And assisting him is Susan Eastrich, and she will be with us via telephone. Here's some other person we're going to have with us tonight as I introduce them. Uh, we have uh, the director of the Department of Public Utilities, Mr. Bentley Chan, um, the, the Department of Finance, Mrs. Megan Coates, Director of Planning, Mr. Joe Emerson, and Deputy County Manager for Community Operations, Mr. Steve Yob. And as we begin uh, this evening, we'll have a word from our county manager. Ms. Thornton, uh, thank you, and good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the first official town hall of 2021, as you noted. And as you, uh, I think any conversation regarding Green City wouldn't be complete if there wasn't a little bit of a history of, um, of the land. So a number of years ago, Henrico County acquired uh, what was the uh, best site, approximately 92 acres, uh, for just over $6 million with the thought that we were going to move all of the governmental operations uh, into uh, this building. And the more we, uh, we looked at it, uh, it, we realized quickly that that would be an eight-year effort, and it would have cost the taxpayers north of $80 million dollars. And all we would be doing is working on office space. So the decision was made by the uh, Board of Supervisors to once again return uh, this property to be a job center. We have been highly, highly selective as to uh, what we have uh, shown uh, there as far as the, the companies. And ultimately, I think what you are going to hear tonight is a great story about a something called an eco district, which uh, will create jobs, but also take us and uh, create a magnet for our economic development authority. So I'm not going to steal uh, Michael or Susan's thunder, but Michael, I, I thank you for everything you continue to do and how you are uh, working on uh, this project. Ms. Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Manager. And uh, as we begin, and just for our major presenter presents, I want to have uh, Mr. Uh, Joe Emerson, who is Director of Planning, to kind of give us an idea of the process for uh, an initiative like this. Mr. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in the town hall tonight. And again, welcome everybody that's, that has tuned into it. Mr. Thornton and I had the pleasure this morning of meeting with some representatives of one of the neighborhoods close by to uh, the Green City proposal, and uh, they had some process questions, and Mr. Thornton has asked me to talk a little bit about that before you hear f about the project details from uh, Mr. Hallmark. Uh, as you have heard through the press and the media and other announcements, it, it certainly sounds like development is imminent on the best products site, and it is, but it's imminent in the concept 
of a development which is over a longer period of time. This will be an urban mixed use proposal to the county. We do not have a formal proposal yet, although we have been in conversations with Mr. Hallmark and his group over, um, over a period of time, and we, we understand that it's, it's going to be a large project, it's going to contain office, it's going to contain a large number of residential units, it's going to be a mixed project, it will have an arena. But for you to understand how we'll look at that when it's, when it's proposed, I'd like to, like to talk, walk you through the process. Um, once the application is filed, and it has not been filed yet, there will be, with that application, impact evaluations that will be reviewed by county staff. And those impact evaluations will address traffic, they'll address schools and school capacities, They'll address public utilities, emergency services, recreation parks and libraries, and environmental concerns. Those will be distributed out to all the agencies in the county as we normally do with these types of applications. And all those agencies will comment back to the planning department and we will include those in a staff report and we'll work with the development team on Mr. Hallmark's side to address any concerns that, that are outstanding. Also included in that process is a very robust community participation process. And that's one thing that Mr. Thornton and I heard this morning was that the citizens wanted to make sure their voice was heard. Through this process, Henrico County always hears from the community and takes into account their concerns. There will be your normal public hearings with the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors before any decisions are made, but also there will be community meetings uh, sponsored by the, the board member and the planning commissioner of the Fairfield District to hear from the constituents and understand what the community's concerns are so Mr. Hallmark and his group can hear those concerns as well as they work with the community and, and to try to address your concerns. So that process will take anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, and then of course you have your plan of development and your site planning processes that you have to go through. So if we had an application filed today, and, and we don't right now, um, although we anticipate it may come soon, we would be a good 18 months away from an actual shovel in the ground because all these topics have to be addressed. And, we certainly look forward to working with the uh, developer and also working with the community on this process to make sure that all needs are addressed. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Emerson, because it's good for the citizens to kind of know uh, how the process, how it's configured and as, how it will take place. And you said something that's very important that is also, we definitely are, listen to and take into consideration uh, the citizens' uh, input, which is very important. Okay, all right, I'm proud now to, to announce the, the gentleman to my left who will be telling us more about Green City, LLC, and that's my good friend, and I'm calling you, this, you Mike, you may. okay? okay. You may. Yeah, you're a good friend, okay? Are you are now. This is the Michael Hallmark. Thank you Mr. very Hallmark. much. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be here, and uh, I will say, uh, even though we've only been at this uh, some months, uh, it's a pleasure to be working with such a, a, a professional staff uh, focused, um, and um, it's very exciting for, for our whole development team to be able to do that. Um, I am I'm Michael Hallmark. My background is uh, first as an architect, um, so I had a very long history uh, designing urban arenas and placemaking in, in major cities. And it's not a surprise that uh, I came to, to Richmond a few years ago specifically to, to work on and develop uh, an urban arena project. Um, uh, uh, the um, opportunity to do such a project in this area was offered up uh, last February, and so we've, uh, I guess it's been more than a few months, it's been virtually a year, uh, or literally a year. 
Um, and so you, we're going to present a project to you uh, tonight uh, very quickly. And as Joe said, there's going to be lots of opportunity. And as Supervisor uh, Thornton said, lots of opportunity to, to delve into all of these issues. But you're going to hear some new terms tonight. You're going to see some ideas uh, tonight that you may not have seen before. And so, um, you know, we, we hope this project um, expands horizons and opportunities for everybody in Henrico County. This is the site um, under consideration, so um, you all know this very well. It's been there for a long time uh, at the intersection of Parham and I-95. Um, it's a, um, the best product site is about 93 acres, and then just to the north of it is another 200 acres uh, owned by um, uh, a, a private entity that we are also going to include in the uh, uh, urban mixed use master plan, but it's not part of the county's holdings at this moment. Uh, overall, the development site that we'll be master planning under the zoning that Joe described is about 200 acres uh, represented here by this slide. Uh, the best product site is, um, is in red. Uh, Scott Farm, uh, just to the north, is, a, is about 110 acres. Uh, there is another property uh, that's not part of the master plan, just to be clear, uh, St. Gertrude's Athletic Fields. Um, and uh, so the, the purple and the red pieces are the ones that will be ultimately be making up our plan. And I just want to uh, jump to the end of the, of the movie uh, for a moment so that we can sort of work our way back to how we got to this. So uh, this represents about a 15-year build-out um, of, of Green City. It starts incrementally. All of this doesn't happen at once. A lot of infrastructure goes in to support this. We'll talk about, the, uh, about that. Uh, the repurposing of best products uh, is, is part of our early work. And you can see there in the, in the center of it uh, an urban arena. These kinds of developments are uh, extraordinarily important because they uh, create synergies. They create synergies of use. They create uh, walkable uh, districts. They, um, they are not um, uh, sort of uh, homogenized zoning so that one entire section of the county is all housing and another entire section is all retail. This zoning was invented specifically for the purpose to get this kind of a project to happen. Um, getting uh, focus only on the properties that will be part of the zoning, you can see here uh, the, the two parcels that will be combined together to form the zoning. We're going to also, I'm going to take you through each of these uses so you don't have to, you know, to memorize this image. We'll, we'll come back to it here in a moment and, and talk about some of the important features of it. Before we do that, I think the, the, probably the biggest question the communities have about projects like this is traffic. Uh, and uh, we, this would not be possible as a project if we were also not simultaneously working to um, uh, advance the Magellan Parkway e extension. Um, I I'll, I'll leave those kinds of questions for you know, my colleagues here at the county to answer, but I think it's important to know that this, that process is underway and will create an important linkage uh, to, to disperse traffic very easily and efficiently toward, you know, toward the freeways and to other major roads and away from, from neighborhoods. You heard the term from the, um, the county uh, executive of, of, uh, of an eco-district. What it, an eco-district is kind of a rare uh, planning type. It, it really describes a district that it tries to achieve uh, high levels of, of uh, sustainable energy performance, uh, wastewater, carbon neutrality, uh, uh, also uh, health uh, we are we are looking for well building certification in in our project throughout. We want to create a walkable, 20 minute lifestyle in Green City. So, the idea of cars flowing in and out um, will be lessened because we want people to live there, live there, work there, and do things there. Um, and then also environmental justice. You know the the process of doing this uh, out in the open in the sunlight and making sure that there's opportunity for everybody to enjoy the features and benefits of the project. Um, there's a lot in the press uh, over the last few years, and it's increasing uh, year by year on climate change. Green City looks uh, very directly at this issue, uh, looks it right in the eye and says, we, we can do better. 
uh, eco districts are designed to um, to be balanced developments in terms of energy waste um, water usage um, I put this slide up because these are all the covers of the Washington Post magazine one publication uh, so periodically every every Sunday they, they publish the Washington Post magazine but uh, more and more we're seeing these kinds of covers the one on the left just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, nurtured by nature as a direct result of people's response to the pandemic uh, green city is very much uh, a nature-based development as well so the green the green applies really to sustainability but it also applies to the natural resources and the development i want to just touch on a few of those sustainability issues um, the connection to nature is first and foremost so one of the great um, discoveries when we got to a chance to uh, walk the site was uh, it's you know wonderfully intact natural resources they need some restoration but they're there and so we want to work with them there are wetlands that are on the site there are uh, stream beds all part of the Chesapeake uh, watershed Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, those are all things that we hope to and plan to not hope to but will integrate into the master plan of the project uh, you see the term biophilic design what that means is that people want to be surrounded by natural things that's why we bring house plants into our houses is why we plant uh, gardens in the backyard uh, it's 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 humans natural instincts to want to be in nature uh, biophilic design stresses that it, it, it makes sure that buildings are integrated well into natural systems so first and foremost our connection to the natural site and where we can make improvements to that and fine-tune that uh, we want to do that and by the way any anything you see here regarding the the, the integrated park system um, that's open to everybody this is not a private development in that sense that that we have about 40% uh, of this site will be left uh, mostly in its natural state uh, with some additions some improvements some cleanup that you'll see but our, our hope is that this becomes a, a tremendous natural resource for the community 20-minute living means then that we will build residential retail office and other uses you know within a zone where people can walk to it so your lifestyle can be working from home if you want to but then you can just walk to you know to make purchases or if you do have an office in the area you can walk there too um, it also means uh, connectivity to mobility so that's something we will we will work on with the county is uh, to make sure that we have access to transit systems uh, 20 minute living is uh, all of these kinds of things uh, we talked about mobility and and getting public transit uh, fully integrated into the, the project uh, that's going to that's one of the longer lead uh, conversations that we're going to have but it starts with a you know with a good plan and a good reason for doing it and we're very we're very forward leaning when it comes to types of systems so uh, we're very interested to explore you know, electric car uh, support um, even uh, electric transit uh, modalities that might happen within the district uh, these are just some of the uh, inspirational images that we, we wanted to put up to show the diversity of, of transportation modes uh, this area gets uh, uh, sufficient water rainwater to uh, to treat seriously in terms of rainwater harvesting also what we do with it after it hits the hits the surfaces of rooftops and and the ground plane and so we're going to work very carefully with the county to um, to bring on uh, good smart stormwater management and uh, rainwater collection features um, aquifer recharging and all those kinds of things that are very important um, energy uh, we, we happen to be at a good point in uh, the conversion to uh, green renewable energy sources both the Commonwealth and Dominion Energy have uh, gone on record in the last year of having uh, a net zero green energy uh, goals within our lifespan well some of our lifespans I hope mine but uh, that's that's the goal uh, green city advances that goal as well and so we uh, 
Uh, we're very excited by the science that this project will help bring to this and the focus to Henrico that we will bring nationally uh, to uh, make this project as, as green as we possibly can. Uh, one of the buildings we will we'll talk about uh, for a few extra minutes, and that's the Best Products Building, uh, which we uh, plan to make a living building. Um, we'll explain what that is. There's about 200 uh, buildings in the world right now that um, uh, have complied with the living building challenge. That means zero uh, uh, fossil fuels used to, to energize the building. It means uh, the water that falls on the building supplies the water for the building. Um, there's, there's several other categories that are very, very um, uh, extreme in the sense of, of the uh, sustainability spectrum. We're very excited because we think this is a great candidate for that. Uh, this then, I want to spend a few minutes on uh, the 40 percent of the site that's, that we plan to um, uh, maintain as park system. Uh, when we first walked the site, we discovered... Um, you know, the, the, the natural stream beds that were there, there wasn't running water in it necessarily. It, it certainly happens when there's rain, uh, uh, rain happening. But the wetlands uh, generally have water in them all the time, and there's an eco, a biodiversity and an ecosystem in these wetlands that need to be maintained, and they're part of the system that we want to protect. But we also want to enjoy them. So these are, these are some of the photographs that, uh, that we took in some of our earliest visits to the site. Um, uh, you know, these are, these are, you know, just as you see them. We didn't do anything special to get these shots, uh, but so are these images. So we, we also came across uh, part, portions of the site that have been used as, as a dump. Vehicles are abandoned. Um, it's, not, it's not throughout, but it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, we, we will want to come in and do a really serious cleanup early on in the process you know, and open up some of these uh, uh, opportunities early. Um, the Green City Park system that you saw in that uh, earlier rendering is a collection of ideas. These include, uh, I'm going to just go through the uh, sequence of them, but you see on the right the map of the district and these, uh, these sort of green, it's like a green pearl necklace, if you will, uh, Sub, sub parklets that are connected by other uh, walking areas. And while you can't probably see it on your screen, if you follow the thread of walking all the way from Parham to the, uh, to the 295, that's a, that's a mile and a half uh, of walking. So a, a nice three mile round trip completely within a park system. Uh, we, would, we would work to restore and um, maintain the, the natural wetlands that are there. Every once in a while, you know, there will be a, a street crossing in the park system, and on those, we certainly will be paying attention to uh, creating uh, integrated green streets so that uh, there's as much of a seamless crossing as possible. There will be a few, we believe, a few man-made water features, and uh, you can see how those uh, those will be enhancing some of our more urban plaza areas. Where we come to wetlands, um, rather than just avoid them altogether, it would be nice to, to experience them. So in those occasions, there's plenty of precedence for creating uh, uh, light, light touching boardwalks that, that cross over the wetlands. Certainly won't build close to them, uh, but these are ways that you get to kind of get into them and experience them a little bit. When we started uh, the master plan back in February, the, the, the pandemic wasn't, wasn't really well understood. We, nobody really knew what the protocols were and how, how to deal with it. But one of the things we started to miss pretty quickly was access to nature and especially with kids, access to, to play. And so uh, I'm old enough to remember when you know, my parents let me loose, I would be able to go out and go make up my own adventure, go see what kind of critters I could find and what kind of forts I could build and those kinds of things. And we're missing that. And so the idea that we would create some opportunity for creative nature play within the district, you know, is very exciting to us too. Uh, meadows. Um, so we, we are just getting into the science of the park district. We have uh, conversations going now with some leading thinkers and in the, uh, biodiversity uh, and, uh, and park planning and very eager to open that up. That, that would be one of, uh, Supervisor, that would be one of the great community conversations to be having because this is something open to everybody. 
I want to just run through the uses so that you understand that that uh, rendering that you saw early on is made up of uh, half a dozen completely discrete uses. Uh, the first one is is residential, and so there's a broad spectrum of housing types that we want to bring to the site, uh, all the way from uh, uh, multifamily units in our village core uh, to townhomes uh, and so forth. Uh, all told about 2,400 residential units over the course of the development cycle, which we'll, which we'll show you here at the end of the presentation. The multifamily uh, pieces of it, about half of the residential units you see here would happen in our village center. And those would all sit atop retail. So there's about 280,000 square feet of, of retail. And these retail operations, all, all of the tenants within Green City will be operating on a, on a green operation protocol as well. There'll be uh, significant um, waste management. There'll be no organic waste that leaves Green City. It will all be processed, separated, mulched uh, on site. And um, uh, we think there's a lot of retailers who may, uh, who want, will want to be in that environment, who want to be in that kind of a community and we think they'll have a lot of customers who will also want to be in part of that environment. And that's, that's the unique um, economic development attractor to this development is it, it, it focuses on those retailers and tenants who might otherwise have passed over in RICO or might otherwise pass over the area uh, if not for a very highly focused development like this. There's a couple of hotels in the plan. Um, uh, they don't happen immediately. I think the first one will happen uh, somewhat in conjunction with the arena development um, in about uh, 2025 at the latest, prob probably uh, could, could happen as early as 24. Uh, the, the next one is probably four or five years after that. But before we're finished with the development, uh, there will be two hotels and then uh, off the office uses. Now these these represent conceptually the amount of office square footage. They don't won't take necessarily these shapes, or these heights, uh, or uh, but how they get organized across the site is it will be part of the planning process. I want to focus um, on the best products headquarters uh, because that was the most daunting building challenge for us. And when we started looking at it, you know, we was it was pretty charming to find some of the quirky elements of the project, things that might be hard for the county to uh, appreciate as, uh, as um, uh, office headquarters, we found kind of interesting. Um, obviously, the Eagles are, are fascinating. For those of you who don't, don't know that history, the Eagles sat upon the airline's terminal building in downtown New York and in, in Manhattan. Um, uh, they were built in the 30s, and the, that's the artist on the right. Um, they were rescued uh, by the best products owners uh, and brought to Richmond, brought to Henrico County uh, as part of their uh, as part of their development. And there they still sit. Uh, you can just see them on top of the building. So um, it would it's a, uh, really fascinating to uh, incorporate them in the project. This is one of the early concepts for creating a living building out of the best products. A building. One of the things uh, that living buildings have to do is generate all of their power themselves. So 100% of the power comes from on-site sources. Um, what, the reason this makes a good candidate for this challenge is that it's a low, broad building. Uh, we don't have to rely on elevators for the most part, and we certainly would have them, but for the most part, we'd want to create an irresistible uh, stair system that would get people up and down. Uh, we would want to use the rooftops for rooftop uh, agriculture uh, or, or other other uses, but basically all aspects of the building become important. Uh, here we've opened up the middle of the of the site so that we've got uh, you know common lobby. Um, at this moment, this the, the the nation doesn't know much about Green City, but we we believe this will be a very attractive. Uh, headquarters uh, site for uh, somebody who has signed a climate pledge. There are um, uh, those of you following the Facebook development project or some of the other big developments, Amazon, Google, all have signed uh, uh, climate pledges at a very high level. They want to work with companies who have also signed climate pledges. Uh, those companies, uh, you know, will covet space like this in the future. Here's that, uh, here's that common lobby. 
and then uh, and then the arena project. Um, we were able to do over the last years, uh, this isn't an impulsive idea at all. This is something that's being, been studied for several years now. Uh, we believe that the market, this is a very, very critically underserved market in this industry. Um, the arena would be about 17,000 seats um, and host about 180 event days. This area, Richmond and Henrico County, along the I-95 corridor, is uh, absolute uh, oceanfront property for the touring economy, the arena touring economy. And you can see arenas here uh, all the way from Boston to, to Miami. I, I was the architect for about half of these arenas, so uh, I understand this routing process and the economies of this. Um, and now that the Coliseum is, is closed, um, there's a tremendous opportunity to capture some some wonderful touring shows. The arena uh, it was pretty far down the road in, in being designed. You can see here that it had a very flexible floor plan. This happens to be the setup in the concert mode. Um, you can see at the bottom where it says uh, 12,467 JPJ. That's the John Paul Jones Arena. We would be a couple thousand seats larger, which means we will capture all the shows. Uh, it also means that for tournament play, uh, we would be able to create a, an opportunity for NCAA uh, first and second round uh, uh, tournaments. Um, uh, the, the local universities uh, all covet the idea of being able to host those kinds of programs here, and we'd be able to do that. And then just quickly, these are the kind of shows that we would imagine uh, happening, uh, 683,000 visitors a year and, and about 180 events. And in the final sequence, and um, we can take questions after that, is just to show you how fast this comes online. So um, as, as Joe and, uh, and others were saying, this isn't something that we start digging on, digging ground uh, on Thursday. So uh, it's going to take some time. We expect this coming year to be the year that we uh, work through uh, organizing the park system, uh, trying to create the boundaries for it, understanding what goes in it. Uh, the first physical building uh, is the best products renovation that you just saw, uh, shown here at the bottom. And the opening for that, we hope, is in 23. Um, we will then start, uh, uh, we will then be working on a couple of other uh, sequences. One would be uh, some residential units, uh, as well as our village core would start uh, coming to to light in 24. Uh, the arena would come online in 25, and I'll just let this roll past, and you can see. Um, is this is this presentation available online, or what's what's the it is. We actually have a, um, you'll, if you go to the uh, Maine County website, there is right on that website information on Green City. Yeah. So, again, I, I'll, I'll explain it, but you don't have to take notes because it's complicated. You'll, you'll, you'll have access to all of this information. But this is, you can see then kind of how this e evolves over the course of, of years. And that's it. Well, okay, there, uh, Mr. Hallmark has uh, given a presentation of what uh, Green City would look like. <clears throat> and um, what we want to do at this point in time now is to see what are some of the questions. And some of the questions that um, uh, I will read from um, the screen uh, as I go over some of those. The first question uh, comes from uh, Mr. Catlett, and the question is, does the name Green City mean that green technologies like solar energy, et cetera, will be used. That's exactly what that means. And uh, it's, uh, I think when we came up with the name, we thought, well, maybe this is a little bit corny, maybe a little bit obvious, but 
But I think at the end, we, we wanted to be really unambiguous on what our aspirations were. So that's absolutely the answer, James, is um, we want to be as, as net zero uh, energy, waste, water uh, as we possibly can. We're not going to achieve that uh, across the board, uh, but uh, we, we are bringing on board some very, very smart national folks to help us achieve that. A couple, a couple of them have worked on eco districts overseas um, and, uh, uh, and also in the U.S. But that'll be very, those will be exciting town halls when we bring those folks in to explain what's going on. Okay, and question, question number two from Alice Pace. Will the county conduct a study of roads accessing proposed green city development? Can the neighborhood prevent Green City from aligning St. Charles Drive with an entrance into the complex. St. Charles is a main thoroughfare through my neighborhood. The road travels from Wilkinson Road to Parham Road. Thank you, Ms. Pace, for that question. And I'm Steve Yab with the County Manager's Office. Uh, Mr. Hallmark has engaged um, you know, transportation professionals that are working on traffic impact studies right now. The, uh, the entrance off St. Charles is actually shown to line up with the spine of this community at this time in the conceptual drawings. Now, if, uh, if that is something that is the best uh, access point to Charles City Road, or excuse me, to um, Parham Road, we would certainly be looking to improve that with uh, traffic signals and so forth. Um, it would not be <clears throat> at all designed to cut through your neighborhood. In fact, I was talking to the director of public works today about your neighborhood, and we were talking about some traffic calming programs there to eliminate cut through traffic that is already a concern of uh, the neighborhood, as well to uh, slow traffic. So uh, it wouldn't at all be designed to uh, cut through your neighborhood. And I, I, would, I saw this, uh, Alice, I saw this question, um, you'd submitted it earlier, so I was prepared to, to address it tonight. Um, because we're going to have a lot of time to, to look at traffic, I, I think it's important that, that this isn't a one-shot question. Um, we would hope that at the end of this, uh, that you will find it as inviting to be in Green City. Um, uh, it would be a lot more inviting for you to come to the things that we have ac across Parham than it would be for people to drive through your neighborhood. Uh, people coming in and out of uh, that area are, are not going to want to cut through residential neighborhoods. You're going to want to get onto Parham, on the freeway, on the, on the uh, right. Brooks Road and other places. So, uh, but uh, your, your voice on this will absolutely be heard and there'll be plenty of opportunity for it. The third question is from Mr. Jerry Richards, and the question is, I live in Chamberlain Falls near Green City Project. Will there be a sound barrier uh, to reduce noise of traffic and other activity? Um, I don't know. We're not, we're not going to generate any noise. Uh, but. Yeah, I, you know, that, that's an issue, again, we, we would look at as the, uh, the traffic engineers do their job. Uh, normally, sound barriers are not put in, in residential communities. Um, you know, again, um, no. it's premature at this point to uh, really discuss that. I mean, we well, I, 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 just to say that this development is not a noise generator. Right. It, it's uh, the opposite. Um, the, the freeway uh, that's there now is uh, is the noise generator, and is, uh, if anything, it's it's the other way around. So, <laughs> correct. Okay. Question four of Miss Morris. It has a beautiful name, so I don't want to mispronounce the first of it, so I'll just say Miss Morris. The question is, will the residents living on Scott Road have access to water and sewer provided by Henrico County? Okay. Hi, Ms. Morris. I'm Bentley Chan with the Department of Public Utilities. And uh, yes, it is our intent uh, to provide access uh, not only to uh, Scott Road, but um, 
uh, global access to uh, water and sewer. Um, it, the timing of it uh, depends on a number of factors, uh, but we are definitely working with uh, the Green City Development to, uh, uh, to see how it all ties together, yes. Okay. Next question from Mr. Bruce Richardson. Will Green City Project require participation of small black-owned business enterprises? If so, what is the goal requirements? Mr. Chairman, I would ask um, Michael to, um, <clears throat> to answer that question, as this was one of the um, draws, if you will, of the project that uh, you brought to us. Yeah, so we, um, uh, we're, we're active in the area in, in developing. We have uh, our development entities working with the VC right now in downtown Richmond, um, right next to the health system campus. We have a 40% MBE goal there that, that we're, we're happy, to, happy to have met. So um, we, are, we are very pro this. We, we have been working for years with the uh, local MBE contractors, and not just contractors, but uh, a cross-section of businesses and printers and, uh, you know, florists, everybody who uh, who is engaged in business, we think there's opportunity to do business with, uh, with this project. Okay, and we go to the next question from Mr. Ed Harrington. How will the plan change if the city of Richmond decides to renovate and reopen the Coliseum? Uh, <laughs> um, it won't change. Um, we, we were active in that process for, for almost four years. And uh, uh, the Coliseum is, is uh, first of all, it, it really can't be renovated and be uh, successful in the marketplace um, for a lot of reasons that are too long to get into here. So um, our plans won't change. We're, our plans to build a 17,000 seat um, uh, nationally focused arena in Henrico County that will serve the region and um, uh, don't, have any, don't have any reason to believe that that's going to change. Okay. Next question from Mr. Colin Burney. How will Henrico prevent this project from being a massive burden on taxpayers like it was for the original terrible arena pitch for Richmond? Brad, do you want to answer that one? I can, and I'm going to ask Megan Coates if she's on as well to uh, chime in. But ultimately, you know, the mechanism that Henrico is using, and these are two totally different projects, so um, I want everybody to understand the project in the city was on a much smaller footprint. You were talking about redevelopment. Here you were talking about large acreage that is largely undeveloped. And so we have a history of success with community development authorities. Um, if you think of Short Pump Town Center, if you think of Reynolds Crossing, um, if you think of uh, White Oak Village. So in our revenue estimates, historically have been very conservative. We've run surpluses. And uh, most of all, this is, uh, this is private placement debt. There is no debt or obligation of the county. This is an economic development project, a private project. At the end of the day, the county will not own uh, an arena. It will not manage, uh, manage an arena. Ultimately, this is uh, part of what the uh, developers will bring forward. To ask is Megan Coates on or Gene if you would come forward please so ladies and gentlemen we have with us Gene Walter this gentleman was your finance director for many many years and he is also helping us with this project so Gene um, yes I believe I mean the manager has really stated the uh, how from our perspective the county would assist in financing the project would be through a community development authority, which, as the manager noted, we've had uh, very successful ones in the past, Short Pump Town Center, right at White Oak, and Reynolds Crossing. And that just uses incremental tax revenues that are generated on the site to pay for uh, public infrastructure that goes onto the site. So um, 
at this point, we're very early in the process, so we don't know exactly what will be done, uh, but that's the process that would be used. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walters. Uh, next question from Lisa Dance. Is there a direct highway access plan for the arena? As a resident near the raceway, traffic is a horror story during races. Well, thank you for that question, Ms. Dance. <clears throat> the access plan for this facility would be via Parham and via Route 1 and via the uh, new Magellan Parkway. These are all projects we've been involved with for some time now, before we uh, met Mr. Hallmark, in fact, and we are proceeding through uh, design and, and getting funding lined up for those projects. We're also, uh, Ms. Dance, working with the Virginia Department of Transportation on a study of the entire uh, Route 1 corridor between uh, Bryan Park and Parham Road, as well as Parham uh, out to uh, 301 for, again, improvements and safety uh, changes that can be made. So we're, we're very active in improving all those roads at this time. And Steve, um, just for the, uh, the, and I just want to say, uh, Mr. Thornton, these are some excellent questions that are being posed. The, um, you know, the county is fortunate. We do have a new uh, funding source through the Central Virginia Transportation Authority. And just near the raceway, you have a significant project that is coming forward. Um, do you want to mention that? Because I think that will also uh, relieve some of the issues that, uh, and of course, NASCAR attendance is not what it was just a number of years ago. No, and thank you for that, Mr. Manager. With the, with the advent of the Central Virginia Transportation Authority this past year, um, where we are now, um, we have about 20 to $30 million per year projected to be funding transportation projects in the future, together with Henrico's own money through a, a bond referendum, um, we are building the Richmond Henrico Turnpike um, and that project is in final design. We're purchasing the property, and it'll very soon be under construction. So um, that, again, is to, uh, to relieve the, the issues that you noted, Ms. Stance, in that area. Okay, thank you very much for that. From uh, Mr. Joseph Boatwright, his question is, uh, what types of residences, 55 plus townhouses, single family, et cetera, and who will be the builders? So I'll, I'll take that. Um, so, so yes to all of those types. Uh, if you remember the residential slide, uh, you have seen all of those listed. And uh, so that's the plan. Uh, the, there's 2,400 residential units of that full cross section, two over twos, townhomes, multifamily, um, senior villas, uh, all of those are, are, are projected. Um, as to the builders, one of the things that is very important for us to study before we form any other development partnerships is the issue of the sustainability. So all of these residences will, will fit the same sustainability standards that the rest of the development fits. So um, uh, high levels of, of uh, solar power, um, uh, uh, resiliency, so battery backups, all those kinds of things. So we are we are still studying what that looks like, what that means, and uh, we have been contacted by you know potential development partners on on housing too. And you know we're not we're not at that point to we're making those kinds of decisions. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Now I have a question that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Here's a question that was given to me earlier, and uh, these are all excellent questions. And this comes from a resident of Wilkinson Estate Subdivision, and uh, it's very interesting. Let me read some of this. What she's written. So many of the residents here like to walk, exercise, <laughs> ride bikes from this subdivision to Three Lakes Park. Uh, and the nearby ball diamond, which is very, very close to the park, because there is no sidewalk uh, 
on between Wilkinson State's Drive and Three Lakes Park. It posed a great danger to us crossing and walking along Wilkinson Road to get there. And what this question does is goes into, it doesn't impact necessarily Green City, but this is, some, this is a subdivision that's not far from Green City. It shows you again that our residents are also interested in a different type of mobility, that is walking when we can. And she continues by saying, cars travel quite fast on this two-lane uh, road. Um, what I don't understand is why the sidewalk from Sterling Forest Subdivision and Douglas Wilder Middle School area didn't extend to Wilkinson Estates Drive. It's roughly one block away from Three Lakes Park. It appears that some revitalization to the park is or has been planned to take place soon. I hope this request will be taken serious enough to perhaps be considered for an upgrade to and for our community. And she writes in, 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 in uh, caps, it is a real safety issue. Currently, we have to drive to Three Lakes Park when we really could walk there to enjoy its serenity and beauty. Uh, and also, this is from Miss, uh, Mrs. Lynette Henley, and she's even saying that she will make herself available to assist in helping us in any way. Um, let me partially answer some of that, Ms. Henley. Um, the county is um, working on sidewalks, and I can't tell you exactly why that sidewalk stopped where it did, but what we're doing now for new um, buildings and initiatives in the, in the complete county is that sidewalks are, I think, are for the most part uh, have to be put in place. Mr. Yard, would you speak a little bit to that? I'd be appreciative. Absolutely. And, and let, me, let me thank Mr. Thornton, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because in 2014, Mr. Thornton offered some of the first county money to match a VDOT project to construct sidewalks along Route 1 and Parham Road. And I know you remember that, Mr. <laughs> Thornton, in response to that community and their needs over there. Uh, so, Mr. Thornton has been a very big supporter, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the Sterling Forest uh, neighborhood was one of the later neighborhoods built in that area. And that's the reason Sterling Forest has sidewalks, because this focus only recently came to Henrico County. So the neighborhoods were, that were built before then uh, didn't always have sidewalks. Now, uh, Ms. Henley has made a, an excellent point. There's a neighborhood that's uh, not a quarter mile from an existing sidewalk that goes to that could connect to a park. It's certainly something that uh, we can look at and will look at. The county is presently uh, working on 25 miles of sidewalks through various uh, parts of the community um, in the design process. We've completed 15 miles to date, and uh, we will add this to the list to look at and hopefully fund and provide for you. So thank you for that excellent question. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Yarb. Okay, the other question coming in from Mr. Will Sittenor. Uh What, if any, impact could this development have on property values of current homeowners? This is a question that is very, very uh, interesting and important. We had this, and Mr. Uh, Emerson alluded to this a little bit. We had a group this morning that talked about it asked about uh, impact about um, values of their homes. So who wants to take this one? Um, Mr. Thornton, I think I can. So um, for those of you that don't know, I, before being the county manager, was also uh, the uh, uh, finance director for the county. And so when you look at um, a development like, let's make a comparison, um, Libby Mill in adjacent um, uh, home uh, values. There is a positive impact, has been. Um, you look at a, uh, a development like Green Gate or some of these mixed-use developments are fairly new to our county. But, um, you know, there is a, there's an amenity factor. And um, I, I, I think I don't see anything negative occurring 
as a result of this development, I only see positive. Does that, does that answer your question, Mr. Ford? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, and also this morning, uh, we had uh, even Mrs. Coates suggested that usually when we have these uh, initiatives, the prices go up for the homes there, so which is a positive thing there. Okay. Uh, next question from Claire Coley. Uh, will the traffic pattern or design of Scott Road be affected? Mr. Yob, you want to take that, please? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ms. Coley. Um, Scott Road itself, we were looking to replace with the uh, new Magellan Parkway. Now, if you uh, go over by the DMV, that's where that would come out on Route 1. And Magellan Parkway will be a um, four-lane divided road uh, with a bridge over the interstate. It will have sidewalk and a, uh, a trail component, a mixed-use bike pedestrian trail. Uh, we're also working on the design on the other side of the highway right now. The, the county uh, is and has been. so. Um, and that will tie in with Magellan Parkway over by the uh, Dominion Virginia Power Operations Center. Uh, Scott Road itself, uh, we are not planning to upgrade at this time, although we are considering it for uh, use for um, um, pedestrian and bike facilities, um, maybe just local access. Thank you, Mr. Yob. The next question from Althea Catlett. Any planning for medical facilities or long-term care facilities? I'm not uh, okay. Okay. So, so uh, Supervisor Thornton. So we uh, we're certainly open and and looking at those uh, opportunities. Um, it's not specifically in the plan today, but it certainly is, is going to be one of our flex flexible points as we uh, develop the master plan. Well, and I think that's the point. Um, when you go into a this type of zoning, you alluded to it, Michael, right? So you're talking about ultimately a 12-year build-out, maybe longer. When we look at some of the other um, developments in the county that have been UNUs, what was initially envisioned, not all of it can, you can't possibly know, you know, in the 12th year, I'm going to do this, but you know, you do have the flexibility of having both residential and commercial uses. And so that's the key and the trick to this, in that you are using or, or, or basically um, uh, responding to the market, right? I mean, yeah. Well, okay, I don't see any other questions. And what I want to do at this point in time is to uh, thank uh, Mr. Hallmark. By the way, did Ms. Eastridge have anything she wanted to say? She, uh, she didn't actually dial in. She's watching. She's, oh, she's, she's, watching. she's texting me. <laughs> okay, so okay. If you want me to relay an answer, but uh, okay. we didn't get the technology uh, figured out to the last minute. So. Okay, okay, okay. Well, we thank, we thank her for participating. Sure. Um, what I would like to say is I want to thank uh, all of the citizens and residents who took part in this in, in a, through a virtual process. We thank you very much. It shows you uh, the creativity that we had to do. And this is one of the positive things that we've gotten from the uh, pandemic uh, challenge. Um, and I would uh, like a little feedback uh, so that I know how, you know, do you, do you like these type of meetings? Um, and now. Uh, let me mention where my next meeting is. What I want to start off is have a lot of and several meetings about Green City because everybody been asking about that, and that's a good thing. Um, so, on Monday, January the 25th at 6 p.m., we're going to also do another meeting on Green City. But in addition to Green City, we're going to also cover something else that I think there was a reference to uh, slightly. And that is that uh, there's also another project going on up at uh, Virginia Center Commons. Mm -hmm. So we want to also acquaint uh, the citizens of the county as to what's going on in that initiative. 
And that initiative we talk about also uh, indoor sports facility. And um, I think you'll find that very um, informative. Again, time is so important. And we want to thank all of the citizens who took time, because all their lives we are busy, but who took time to get involved in the county in which you live, to ask questions, meaningful questions, because uh, we, we're not supposed to have all the answers. That's why we work for you. And what we have to do is make sure that we listen well. And one of the whole raison d'etre of these type of meetings is for us to listen to you and for us to share information with you and for us to listen so that we can have a good product, so that we can continue to have an outstanding county. Um, so at this time, does anyone else have any input in anything? If not, I'm going to bring this to a close and thank all the people for participating. And